Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you here this evening for this special service and our Hanging of the Green service. If you would, stand and join me for the call to worship. Sing with me, oh come, all ye faithful. together. Lord, we thank you for, uh, God, the opportunity to gather again this evening. And God, we thank you for this service, God, as we uh, transform your sanctuary to prepare uh, for the Christmas season. And God, what we are here to rejoice in and declare is that our Lord and Savior was born in a manger, God, but he's on the right hand of power at this time. And at one, at some point, uh, God, in your will, you're going to call him or send him to call us home. And we're thankful for that promise. Pray to be with our service, God, those who will be speaking in our time of uh, our reading and our time of our message and our time of singing. We pray for Brother Keith and the ladies that lead us in that. Pray that you receive all praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening. As Brother Keith said, we're glad that you are here. This is our Hanging of the Green service. I need you to go ahead and pull out this little handy-dandy uh, bulletin there, program. We're going to do a responsive reading here in just a second. And I said that to remind myself because every year I turn and walk back and Keith says, hey, you got to go do your part. And uh, so that's just kind of my way of remembering that. A couple of quick announcements to let you know. December 8th, 9th, and 10th is our live nativity scene. Today's the last day to sign up. We will be working on the scenes, uh, cast, and crew. And uh, we'll get that out to you in the next few days to make sure that you will be able to be here uh, on those particular nights to serve in that capacity. If you have not signed up but you'd like to sign up, uh, make sure you do that prior to this uh, evening, the, the, prior to the end of this day. And we would appreciate that at the conclusion of the service. I'm going to ask you to be praying, as we said this morning, for a couple of folks, uh, funeral services tomorrow. Um, Miss uh, Powell, uh, Sharon Donald's mother, a funeral is 11 o'clock tomorrow in Florence. And then Mr. James Kemp, a uh, funeral is 2 o'clock tomorrow in Saltillo. Uh, so if you'll be praying for them, I know they would appreciate that in the upcoming days. We've got a couple in the hospital. If you'll be praying for them as well, and uh, I know that they would appreciate that as with their families. Does anyone else have any other announcements to be made? Any announcements? All right, Mr. Jerry, you have the cybersuit training report. 93, thank you. If you have your, as I said, uh, your, your worship guide, your uh, bulletin there, if you will uh, follow along with me here in the responsive reading, and then as soon as we conclude, Caitlin, if you'll make your way up here. The gathering. This evening we come together to prepare for the birthday of a king. We begin the special and holy season of Advent, the season of going toward the birth of Christ. Let our songs and symbols represent our personal rededication of the glory of God and the manifestation of his love through his son, Jesus Christ. Katie?
The bright blood red poinsettia has become the most popular of all Christmas flowers. The star of the leaf is said to represent the star that stood over the Christ child. The red flower stands for the blood of the male infants that King Herod had slain. The red flower represents the shed blood of Christ who came to be our Savior. We call this evening service the hanging of the green because traditionally evergreens have been used to emphasize the nativity. Green represents renewal, new life, freshness, and rebirth. Plants such as pine, fir, holly, ivy, and mistletoe are called evergreens. It's no wonder that we decorate our sanctuary and our homes with evergreens during this Advent season. It reminds us of the life that was and is evergreen ever alive. The wreaths that are hung around our sanctuary also have symbolic significance. Their endless circle reminds us of the endless love of God, and their green color, which is evergreen, reminds us that the new life that God gives to us will never die. With the men of old, the arraying of greens in the home had some sacramental significance, as if the greens themselves carried with them blessings into the house. Our forefathers spoke of fetching hollowed sprigs from the woods as bringing home Christmas. One thing is certain, the greenery had a purpose. It was never used merely because it was decorative. We should think of the greenery as symbolic of the everlasting light given at Christmas, signifying a blessing in both our homes and our churches. 
At this time of year, we, as a congregation, also remember the blood of Christ shed for our eternal life. For if it were not for the birth of this Christ child, there would be no remission for our sins. The Advent wreath is exactly what the word implies, a circle of evergreens bound together. Placement in a circle came to represent God's eternity and perfection. Evergreens and candles are used to remind us of God's gift of life through Jesus Christ to a world of darkness. The emphasis of the wreath is anticipation of the Messiah's coming. Three of the candles are purple, representing the darkness before the light. One candle, the fourth one, is pink to represent the joyfulness of Christ's coming. The fifth candle, the center candle, is white and is called Christ's candle. It is symbolic of what each of us must do during the Christmas season as we make ready for the Christ child to be center of our lives. The night Joseph and Mary found their only available lodging in that stable in Bethlehem, Luke's gospel tells us that shepherds were out in the fields watching over their flocks. When an angel's appearance in the night sky frightened them, the angel gave them the news of the birth of the Savior, and they hurried to Bethlehem and found the baby. Upon their return, the shepherds spread the word about all they had seen and heard. Matthew's gospel tells us of wise men following a star that led them to the young child, Jesus. The wise men brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and bowed down and worshiped him. Matthew 1, 23 reads, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us.
The banners that are hung in our sanctuary also have symbolic significance. Their scenes remind us that our Savior was born into this world in the most humble of circumstance. Yet his coming was the fulfillment of God's promise as the final sacrifice for all men, from common shepherds to the most powerful kings.
Rachel and Angie, we appreciate that. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. I decided to just continue to preach through the disciples. I made a few changes uh, on this message for tonight. Uh, to be completely honest, when I was preparing what I would call my preaching schedule, I forgot all about the hanging of the green service. And uh, as we began to walk through this and figure it out, uh, the Lord just laid on my heart to leave it here. So, But I think looking at James and continue to look at James, there's something that we can look at and apply to our lives and understand what this is as the Christmas season approaches. So the incidents of James, part two, we began looking at this a couple of weeks ago. First, we began by looking at why he was called, or he and John were called the sons of thunder. Uh, in this passage of Scripture, if you recall, Jesus was par- preparing to pass through Samaria. Uh, as we have studied, he was on the way to Jerusalem for the final Passover, which he knew would cultivate ultimately in his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but it's very much significant that he was making his way through Samaria. The Samaritans were the mixed race offspring of Israelites from the northern kingdom. If you know your history, you know when the Israelites were conquered by the Assyrians, the most prominent and the most influential people, the most powerful people in the tribes were taken into captivity, and the land was resettled with pagans, unbelievers, and foreigners who were loyal to the Assyrian king rather than to Yahweh. So many of the original Israelites, descendants who later returned to Samaria uh, from captivity, were uh, the product of intermarriage between pagans, so the culture of Samaria suited them perfectly. Uh, It was a paganistic mindset, those not listening to what Christ was calling them to do, but we know that Jesus did everything that he did with, with intent and on purpose, and so the way that he was going was not something that should surprise them, but he was going right through Samaria, and he had always shown kindness and goodwill towards Samaritans, so it was not anything new for him to do what needed to be done. And then we looked at what Elijah had encountered in 2 Kings. This encounter when God sent down the fire from heaven is what James and John was referring to, what we would call the incidents of James, our second part here in Luke chapter 9 that we're going to look at. And so with that in mind, I would like to begin and we will conclude with this first incident, uh, the incident number one, which is fire from above. If you were here, you recall this, you understand this, and maybe you have studied this and you are aware of the scripture. <clears throat> Our final passage last week was 2 Kings chapter 1. Uh, Looking at this incident, 2 Kings chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, it reads, And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came down, there came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. If you recall, the king had sent individuals and armies to go to find out what Elijah was doing, and they showed up. The Lord said, No, nope, you're done, you're out. Number two comes, No, nope, you're done, you're out. Uh, the Assyrian king wasn't listening, so he sent a third group, and the third group says, I might need to pay attention to what this Elijah guy's got going on and who's on his side. So he shows up and says, Hey, I don't know who you are, but can we have favor in your sight? I don't want to be like these other people, right? I don't want to be like these predecessors. And so that's where we are in 2 Kings chapter 1. And so all of this story or this particular story had taken place in the very region through which Jesus proposed to travel to Jerusalem. So James and John and the disciples that are on their way ultimately to Jerusalem for the final Passover knew that this was very much significant, that the story of Elijah in the Old Testament was something that they had studied, something they had learned, and something that they were very familiar with. And so James and John's response to sending fire down from heaven was very much fitting and knowing that they were passing through this particular area or this particular region that the Samaritans were not very much hospitable. They were very much, uh, did not like the Jews, did not like Jesus or his story. And so James and John says, hey, let's just take them out. Elijah did, so why can't we? Well, we know that this story that Elijah was not condemned for his actions. Elijah did exactly what God had told him to do. And ultimately, the fire coming down from heaven because of the power of God. But God used Elijah to call that down to take place. And so James and John says, well, you did it for Elijah. Can you not do it for us? Well, that's not the proper response. Uh, Their mindset was not right. Their heart was not right. Their motives were not right. So their arrogant tone was something probably like this. Lord, do you want us to consume these people with fire? 
Do you want us to call down the fire to wipe these people out? Do you want us to make sure they're not in the way just like Elijah did? Now, in reality, they knew that they did not possess that power, that that power was from God and from God alone, but they knew that Jesus Christ had the power. And Jesus Christ was with them. And, and Jesus Christ knew that he could do it if he wanted to do it. He would have done it himself at that moment, and he would not have been any discussion about it. But Jesus says, no, no, we're not going to do this. And said, let me teach you a little bit. When I am challenged, and Jesus Christ speaking here, when I'm challenged many times by adversaries and those who are around me that want me to produce some uh, cosmic miracle or some miracle that is not for the glory of the Lord, look at what Christ says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. It says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. In other words, James and John were in effect asking Jesus Christ to enable them to do what they knew that he would not do. They knew that he was not going to say, okay, I'm going to give you all the ability in this moment. Well, how do we know? They had been under his teaching. They had seen what had happened and they had seen the spirit and way that he had taught. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. He was on a mission to rescue, not a mission of judgment. Although he had every right to demand worship, he could have done that. But that's not what he was trying to do. Matthew 20.28 20, says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, John 3.17, we often neglect it. We stopped at John 3.16, but verse 17 is important too. It says, For God sent his, not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus was saying, hey guys, it's not the time to send fire down. It's time for them to realize that, hey, we need to show them Jesus, right? We need to show them the message that I have. And Jesus goes on in John chapter 12, says, hey, I'm the light of the world. Don't, don't, don't ever forget that. I am the light and the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, there will come a time that God will judge the world. Don't mishear that. But in this moment, what he's teaching is, hey, it's not today, right? It's not right now for you two knuckleheads to have the power to breathe down fire. Could you imagine allowing Keith and myself to just blow fire down and wipe people out? There'd be a lot less people on the earth. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now. And then if you get me and my brother involved, there'd be no hope for all of humanity. I'll go ahead and tell you right now. And so the idea is God says, hey, you want it, but you don't need it, right? Because I came to rescue. I came to seek and save. I came to, to serve. The Bible continues and tells us that, again, there will be a time that he will judge, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of God. Of his power. It's going to come a day, folks, that one day people are going to wish that they had accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the first eight verses, a passage we're all familiar with, to everything there is a season, a time and a purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which has been planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. In other words, it's a time for everything. Solomon makes it clear that there will be a time that God's judgment will rain down. James and John, in that moment, forgot a very important phrase in the Scripture. Now is the day of salvation in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It reads in verse 2, For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. And behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 
They had forgotten that the Lord obviously wanted people saved in that moment. That people wanted to come to know Jesus Christ. And as you study these guys, James and John, James, uh, who we're looking at the last couple of weeks, there's a touch of nobility in their indignation against the Samaritans. Their, their zeal, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, their, their zeal was powerful, but zeal in the wrong direction is not always good. And so their mindset is, hey, our zeal is to defend the honor of Christ. It's one of our virtues. We're going to do whatever we can do because our wrath is a righteous wrath. I'm not going to sit down and be passive. I'm not going to sit down and be quiet. I'm going to understand this resentment, but I want you to know something important. That their mindset wasn't right. Their heart wasn't right. They were filled with arrogance. And their proposed remedy to just rain down fire on the Samaritans was not what God wanted them to do in this moment. Now, note also that Jesus was not by any means condemning what Elijah had done in his day. Nor was the Lord advocating a pacifist approach to conflict. So that's okay to approach conflict. The Bible makes it clear. But what Elijah did in his moment was for the sake of God's glory and God's approval. And so the fire from heaven that rained down in the presence of Elijah was a public display of God's wrath, not Elijah's wrath. It was a public display of God's wrath, and it was deserved severe judgment against an evil regime regime that did not want to adhere what Christ was saying. They did not want to accept, and so such wickedness calls for such judgment. And sooner or later, folks, this nation is going to be in trouble if we don't realize that our wickedness as a nation is going to call for his judgment. But think about it like this. Instant destruction, such instant destruction would be fitting every time anyone sinned, right? It could happen. God could say, all right, there's no hope, you're done. Uh, You messed up too many times, you're out. You messed up, you're out. So obviously we wouldn't be here today. But that's not how it always works, right? The Lord's forgiving God. Psalm 145, 9 says, The Lord is good all his, and his tender mercies over all of his works. He continues in Exodus 34, 6, The Lord passed by before him, this is Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. It continues in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, saying to them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live and turn ye, turn ye your evil ways for why, why will ye die, O house of Israel? In other words, the Lord doesn't want anyone to experience hell. The Lord doesn't want anyone to be eternally separated from him. So Jesus is teaching, his example is teaching James that loving kindness, that mercy are our virtues to be cultivated as much as any type of righteous indignation or fiery zeal. And so instead of calling down fire from heaven, it says in Luke 9, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. So what happens? They found accommodations elsewhere. They found out they need to do something a little bit different. As you wrap this incident up, the fire from above, maybe you've studied this, maybe you haven't, but after a few years or a few years after this incident took place, as the early church began to grow and people began to preach, there's an individual who comes in on the scene named Philip. Philip is the deacon who preached Jesus to them in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 5 reads, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. That's important. A marvelous thing happened. Verse 6 and following. And the people with one accord gave heed unto these things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily say this, but I'm inclined to believe with all of my heart that there were many individuals who were saved under Philip's preaching in Acts chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, that could have been destroyed by fire had Jesus Christ allowed James and John to rain down fire in that moment. But Jesus knew in his sovereignty, hey, I'm going to spare these folks because a few years down the road, Philip's going to show up and he's going to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit's going to move because it's descended now, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. And these folks are coming to know Jesus Christ as their person. Personal Lord and Savior. Aren't you glad the fire didn't rain now? Aren't you glad you had one more day to accept Jesus as your Savior? Same example here. 
And maybe you're here tonight, you don't know the Lord, and, and maybe tonight's the day you realize, hey, you know what, today's the day that the Lord can call me home, and, and I need to get it right. Because I can tell you, death's all around us, if you haven't noticed yet. They're, it's everywhere. Two tomorrow, one Tuesday, and we've already had a couple of others. So the idea is, hey, you never know when God's going to call you home. So understand and rejoice that salvation is of the Lord. The second incident we see with James, ultimately with John, is what I'm going to call the kingdom's thrones or the thrones of the kingdom. Now, when you study this in the scripture, we're going to look at it in Matthew chapter moment and chapter 20 in a moment. Now, this is an insight. This story gives us the insight of James's character. Now, we've studied a little bit, and we see that James was not only fervent, he was not only passionate, zealous, and insensitive, but there were times that the poor old James was ambitious and overconfident. And we see that in this story as he and his brother John engage to attempt to get status over everybody else. Hey, give us one more little step higher than everyone else. Matthew chapter 20. We call this the kingdom's thrones. Verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? That's good King James there. She saith unto him, Grant thee. Grant that these, my two sons, may sit, the one on the right and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? They say unto him, Well, of course, right? We're able. How arrogant they are. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but if it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with the indignation against the two brethren. Now, when you study the scripture here, you will see that Mark, the gospel of Mark, also records this incident. But this incident in the gospel of Mark does not mention that James and John could have enlisted their mother for interceding on their behalf. Matthew records that she is the one who made the request of Jesus in comparison with Mark's account, but it's clear that she's put up by her sons to do so. Look at Matthew 27, 56. Among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. There's one. Mark 16 says it like this. And when the Sabbath was part, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come up and anoint him. So who was this lady? She was a lady that had followed Jesus. She was one of the many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee that was ministering to him based on Matthew chapter 27. And she was probably one of the individuals that supported him financially, supported him as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ would do. And so because of their family's affluence and because of the family's influence, Salome would have been able to join her son, sons right by Jesus Christ because of that title and thought that she had the ability to ask Jesus Christ to do this or to do that. But the thought process of this request, obviously had to have been birthed in the mind of James and John, thinking that they were able to sit on the right and on the left. And, and we see here that Jesus makes the statement in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But he immediately follows it with verse 30. Here it is, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Hey, there's going to come a day that you're going to sit over here, but you got to realize before you can be on the pulpit, right, you got to be able to stack the chairs. Before you can be on top, you got to be willing to be last. Before you can do this, you got to be willing to do that. And so before you say, hey, I am deserving of sitting on the right and the left, first of all, you need to be deserving of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Are you deserving? In reality, we deserve a place called hell, but Christ says, no, no, I'm going to make a way for you. But the promise of these thrones, what this lady was desiring was a little bit arrogant, we would agree, agree. A little bit out of line, we would probably say. These guys were already a part of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. These guys had already been closer to Jesus than the others might have been. 
And so the mother says, you know what? My kids deserve it. You know, sound like a bunch of mothers, right? My kids deserve to sit at the right of the hand. So my teacher says, I'm, or my mother says, I'm going to go to the coach, right? Y'all know how this goes. And say, my coach deserves to play. And we know how that goes most of the time. We think because we give the most money or we do this or we do that, that our kids are able to do it. And Jesus Christ says, no, that's not the case. It's not the case at all. What is the case is this. Jesus responds with the prelude of glory, and it says, Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He'd explained this numerous times. He made sure everyone knew what was happening. They had no real concept of what was happening, that the, the ultimately the drinking of the wrath and what was happening here. But them in their arrogance says, Of course we are. We are are able because they wanted the position they wanted the power they wanted the title they wanted the throne but God says no that's not how this is going to go the chief of thrones Jesus says in Matthew 20 we're not necessarily a part of the bargain in verse 23 and he said unto them you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with but to sit on my right and sit on my left it's not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared for my Father. This caused a conflict. It caused a conflict among the other ten. Peter, uh, James and John thought that they were the ones that should be there. The other ten's disciples heard about it. They were displeased. They were frustrated. Luke 22, 24 tells us that they were obviously not living as a growing saint that we just talked about this morning, being knit together in the bondage of love, because 24 in Luke 22 says that there was strife among them. And there was strife among them because, let's be honest, they just wouldn't stay in their lane, right? James and John inserted or asserted themselves in a place that they had no desire to be, and it caused problems among other people. James wanted a crown of glory. Jesus says, no, I'm going to give you a cup of suffering. James wanted power. Jesus says, I'm going to give you servanthood. James wanted a place of prominence. Jesus gave him a martyr's grave. James wanted to rule. Jesus gave him a sword, not to weld, but to be instrument of his execution. Fourteen years after this, James would become the first disciple of the twelve to be killed by his faith. I bet you he wasn't expecting that when he was asking to sit on the throne. I bet you in his mind he wasn't saying, well, I'm only going to be there for a short period of time, then I'm going to be there. So what do we see about James? James is the prototype of the passionate zealous front runner who is dynamic, strong, and ambitious. His passions was tempered by sensitivity and grace. Somewhere along the line, he was much like me. He didn't know how to bridle his tongue. He didn't know how to control his anger. He didn't know how to redirect his zeal. He didn't know how to eliminate his thirst for revenge. And, and there were times that he completely lost himself in selfish ambition. But the Lord still used him. This is where it's good. The Lord still used him to do a wonderful work in the early church. Why does that matter? Why is that important? It means this, that if we're willing to surrender our life to Jesus, live a life controlled of the Holy Spirit, allow our life to be blended with the leading of the Holy Spirit, guiding of the Holy Spirit, to be blended with patience and long-suffering, then the zeal of James, maybe the zeal of you, is a fantastic instrument in the hands of God. And we can see that when our mind is right and our heart is right and our thoughts are going the right direction and our motives are in the right direction, that God can take a bundle of mess and make it into something pretty. That even though James said by his mom ultimately, hey, can my son sit on the right and the left? And Jesus says, no, that's not the case. Jesus still used the James to do big things. So why is that important on this hanging of the green service? Without the birth of Jesus, there'd be no hope. There'd be no hope. There'd be no everlasting life. There'd be no evergreen. There'd be no wreath, the symbol of the circle. There'd be none of these things, the poinsettia, which is the blood of Christ. And therefore, there's no remission of sins. And so James understood the importance of what we're looking at tonight. James understood the importance that Jesus Christ died for his sins. And Jesus Christ says, I'm going to use you regardless of your hard-headedness. And I'm going to use you regardless of your zeal going the wrong direction. And I'm going to use you regarding your passion passion going the wrong direction, and I'm going to bring you back in line so that you can be used for me, by me, and for my honor and for my glory. Christmas season, not my favorite time of the year. 
hard to believe, probably by some of you. My Scrooge, eh, probably. And I just, I'm not a huge fan at times because it gets so busy. And we neglect the importance of it. We ne neglect what's happening. We neglect what God is doing. We get so wrapped up. I'm guilty of it. Of all the places we have to be that we forget, had the first Christmas not taken place, we wouldn't be where we are today. So my challenge to you is don't be like James. Don't get so distracted by things that don't matter. Don't get so distracted by things that don't matter for the kingdom. Don't get so wrapped up in all the things that you have to do. I'm preaching to myself here. Don't get wrapped up in all the things that you have to do or places that you have to be, but simply be still and be thankful that the end was good enough. Oh, wait, no. The manger was good enough. Jesus deserved far more, but he was okay with the manger because he knew his goal he knew the prophecy. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to take place. I pray that you guys have a great Christmas, but I also pray that you guys instill in your kids, your grandkids, and your friends the importance of this season, which is this, to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can be here and gather together. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you again, and we thank you for the word. And, God, we ask that you will... Just continue to move in our hearts and our minds. And God, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as our Lord and Savior, God, I pray today will be the day of salvation. God, I pray that we'll take what we've learned from James over the last couple of weeks, God, and apply it to our life and make sure that we're pointing the right direction and living a life that brings honor and glory to you. God, may this Christmas season be a time of happiness and joy. But God, I ask for comfort for those that may be going through a difficult time with the loss of a loved one or impending death and things that are happening around them. God, we ask for your presence to be felt. But God, we ask that you'll guide, guard, and direct us, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand if you would sing with me. Now may God, creator of light and trees and flowers, grant us peace. As we have decorated this place of worship, may we also live lives of worship decorated with God's forever things, forever love, forever life, forever living, forever growing, forever green. In the name of God's love, and light in Jesus' name, amen and amen.